Hello, my name is Roman Jean Dihashvili, and this is the first of the lectures on greatest minds in chess history. Greatest minds that I had encounters with and my personal memories of them and my uh, pick of the most interesting games. So I, I came to this country, to the United States in 1979. Um, and in 1980, in April, maybe April or May, I went to California to play very prestigious Lone Pine tournament. I was rated then uh, very highly in the world, maybe in top 10. And I went to play this prestigious tournament and I was lucky enough to win clear first place. And I was thrilled, of course, but my thrill of winning this prestigious tournament and large amount of money was quickly replaced by approach from United States Chess Federation to go to Pasadena and meet with Bobby Fischer. And this was by far the biggest thrill I could possibly experience. Uh, idea was to talk to him and somehow to get him come back to chess. Remember, the year was 1980, and he was already eight years in, in retirement. Well, he wasn't playing for uh, eight years since he won the World Championship in 72, with the exception of here and there a few blitz games. My meeting with Fisher was absolutely unforgettable, even though it didn't end up on a very good uh, note, but still I was analyzing with him some chess positions and what amazed me, and I thought this may not be a human, maybe I'm dealing with a superhuman. I was showing him one position and I was telling him that I had this in my one of my junior tournaments and here and there and I made this move on which he said, no, you are wrong. He said, you played that move first and then you played this. And he remembered my games better than I did. And I had pretty good memory, I still do. And I was absolutely stunned. And then I heard from some other people, namely uh, his former friend and person that he played a lot of blitz games with, with a huge handicap, Norbert Leopoldi from Chicago. That's a, that was a businessman who loved, absolutely loved chess. And when uh, Fisher visited his house in Chicago, uh, he remembers Fisher reading some chess book and memorizing entire page, word by word. That was quite amazing. And I think it's extraordinary. So when I played with Fisher, I played him <clears throat> a lot of... Uh, Blitz games, I played in three minute games and five minute games. At that point, I was quite strong blitz player. I won some major tournaments and I was amazed in the shape he was when he did, said, well, taking in consideration that he hasn't played for eight years. And if I remember, because if I don't play for one year, I feel like I'm very, very rusty. And that was eight years. But on the other hand, that was Fisher. 
and which makes a great difference. So I remember I looked a lot of games. When you want to analyze Fisher games and you want to, you want to bring something, uh, some, some very good, instructive and beautiful games, you're going to have very hard time picking it. Picking Fisher's game is not easy. Well, the game I picked was against Argentina. Argentinian IM was played in 1970. It's the first game. 1970, he was already very strong player. Uh, uh, Sam Schweber and Let's look at this game. This, what is out of ordinary in this game? You're going to see Fisher in a <clears throat> way that not too many people have seen him. E46, D4, D5, regular French, Knight C3, Bishop B4, E5, C5, this part of the game does not need any commentaries. Pawn takes c3, queen c7, knight f3. We are still in theory, knight c6, bishop e2. Now bishop e2 is interesting move, not bishop d3, which may um, allow c takes d, and after c takes d, knight takes d4, followed by queen c3 check. Well, and bishop e2 was played, and after bishop d7, white castled, black played knight e7, a4. Very typical move for this variation of French defense because bishop is attempting to go to a3 from c1. Knight a5, rook e1, c takes d, c takes d, and knight c4. What Fisher does now just makes moves that make a lot of sense, just improving position of his minor pieces. Bishop d3, h6, trying to prevent knight g5, knight d2, exchanging the only active piece of blacks, which is knight on uh, c4. Knight takes d2, bishop takes d2, knight c6, and queen g4. White has clear advantage here. Uh, two bishops and especially bad bishop of blacks on d7 and some uh, advantage in development. So far, white haven't made any moves that ordinary decent player wouldn't have made. So white made just common sense moves, and that's what gave them a better position. G6 was played, and now rook E3. And after castling, Fisher made in this position uh, unusual move, rook G3. Now, why rook G3? This is not the move. I analyzed this game very, very carefully. And this is not the move that I could understand right away. So what this move does just prevents black from any activity. So for example, if g5, h4, but not rook f3 because Rook f3, this is what makes the 
this game especially powerful. This, and the beauty of these games by a lot of commentators was missed. Rook f3 is not a good move because of f5. And we're going to look why. Rook g3 was played. I will show you why rook f3 immediately wasn't good. And after king b8, rook f3 is very powerful. So what we have to do here, we have to see what happened after rook f3 and what would have happened if king was on c8, which means if white played rook f3 immediately. So rook f3, rook g3 was played, and after king b8, rook f3. Black played f5, and white played ef. Keep in mind, with king on c8, it's not a good idea for white. e5, well, in this position, f5 is practically forced because if black protects the f7 pawn, then after rook f6, their position is very pitiful. So f5, ef, and e5. Now queen goes to g3, and e4 is not playable because of bishop f4. Now you see why king has to stand on b8. So that's why king in this position, if white played rook f3, f5, ef, e5, this position is not good for white. They are just simply losing material. So that's why Fisher wait, waited until black plays king b8, and now he went rook f3. And this was missed when people were selecting Fisher's best games. Rook g3, rook f3 was missed, the idea, whole, whole beauty of this maneuver. Now after f5, and calculation goes a lot farther than that. After queen g3, now knight takes d4, and rook e3. Here, black has nearly lost position, because e5 pawn is hanging, g6 pawn is hanging, e4 is nearly forced, This is the key of whole idea. Without rook takes e4, all idea of white might have backfired. This is absolutely gorgeous move. Of course, black cannot retake the rook because of bishop f4. Queen takes g3, and now simply rook takes d4. White has only one bishop for a queen. But the problem is that black's queen is trapped. Black's queen can only retreat on h to b8 diagonal where it will be lost after bishop f4 anyway. So after queen takes g3, rook takes d4, Queen g4 was played. Well, better way would have been slightly better way. Queen d6, and after bishop f4, bishop e8, and after rook e1, rook f8, it's still big advantage by white because c4 will win a pawn on d5 and white simply has an extra pawn for 
hardly any compensation. Rook takes f2 loses to rook takes e8. And, but this could have been slightly better option than black's queen g4. After queen g4, rook takes g4, bishop takes g4, bishop takes g6. White has two pawns for exchange. They have two pawns and a bishop for rook. But the f pawn is extremely powerful and very difficult for black to defend this position. Well, after bishop takes g6, I would say position is completely lost. Rook h g8, bishop h7, rook h8, bishop d3, rook d to e8, f7. Very simple approach. And here, black is going down real quickly. f8, queen, rook takes, bishop to b4, rook f7, bishop takes rook, rook takes bishop. White has two connected pass pawns on a king side, three versus one, and easily one position. Rest actually, rest of the game needs no commentary. Say five, king, king c7, f3, bishop d7, king f2, rook f7, king e3, king is going to d4, king d6, g3, king c5, f4, bishop g4, rook b1. Well, white has multiple ways to win this game. And after uh, rook e7 check game, white simply retreated the king. It could have gone to f2 also. The game lasted very few moves and Fisher won. What I think about this game is it played, it was played very, very precisely and very well. Now, why this game so was so memorable for me? The reason why, let me explain to you, that what made difference between Fisher and other top players. In this position, every player, every good player, every reasonable player, what they would do, they would go h4 and then queen f4, maybe, a, a queen f4 or rook, rook f3, trying slowly to put pressure on a black's position. In fact, I don't know who would have played here rook e3 move. White could have played simply c3, and they would have had long-term advantage. Fisher goes for a maximum pressure on black's position. In sets up rook g3, uh, sets up devilish trap that had success, or that's been successful. Now, this is concrete approach that a lot of other GMs don't use. They do, they play general principles, positionally sound moves. Fisher does that too, but he was extremely good in calculating in positions that does not necessarily need calculation, but it's very, very helpful. Now, also, after f5, ef, e5, I have to, well, this is how far his calculation went. 
he's he has seen every move there and it's not easy to go for this position knowing you're going to end up with exchange down take a look at this position this is the position fisher went to when he played when he played rook g3 he played rook g3 he has already seen the position i just showed you which is i think extraordinary well i asked se several very strong players how would they pursue in this position and uh, even after king b8 i said would do would they go for rook f3 f5 would they allow this and not one of them said that they will allow it everybody said they will stop it the only one person it's not really a person that said that yeah rook f3 is good move allowing f5 and taking on f6 and seeing all this uh, what happened in the game was Ripka, the engine. So, if Ripka program is the only, well, suggestion, only person, or only program, or only object, subject that made suggestion that it's good to allow a five and allow e five, and this is bad for black and this was bad for black and every move was made by black is forced and white end up in winning position this is quite amazing and my of course i was very impressed with this game but uh, what is a big puzzle for me how come this game didn't go to 60 memorable games well, Fisher was very critical of himself. Apparently, he didn't think for him this calculation was just a normal thing. And I know, well, this is the kind of thing I know better than Fisher. I know better than Fisher that 99% uh, of strong players would not go that far calculating since f to fisher it was natural and it was no big deal uh that's why he didn't include it in his 60 memorable games but i think it's quite amazing and this is the game i was very very much impressed well but you're gonna get impressed every time you see Fisher's games. So that's the end of our part one of great memorable Fisher's games.